Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst and I'm here with special guest co-host Felix Lutsch. Today we're speaking with Dan Finlay, who is the founder and group manager of MetaMask. Um, but before we talk with Dan about MetaMask, um, let me tell you about our sponsors this week. Stake Wallet is your new favorite multi-chain mobile wallet that puts the power of Web3 Web at your fingertips. In just a few taps, you can stake and manage your assets on over 22 built-in protocols, including all major EVMs, Layer 2s and non-EVMs like Cosmos, Solana, Nier and more. Just recently, they've integrated Liquid AVAX, Liquid Solana and Matic staking. And with more integrations being added every few weeks, jump into the Discord to let them know what you'd like to see on their roadmap. Stake Wallet also has a multi-chain NFT, NFT support, so you can uh, view all of the NFTs you have in one place. Um, and you can download it on the iOS uh, store or on Android and uh, and also on the internet at stakewallet.fi. Um, stake is spelled like the meat, so S-T-E-A-K. Our other sponsor today is Cowswap. So DEXs are great, but they're vulnerable to problems like MEV failed transactions and high gas costs. CowSwap tackles these issues head on and offers a new kind of trading experience. Built by Gnosis, CowSwap is a meta DEX aggregator. That's right, it's a DEX aggregator. aggregator. It fights MEV by matching overlapping orders directly. If no coincidences of ones is found, that's where the cow comes from, trades are settled on a variety of underlying on-chain AMMs, depending on which pool offers the best price. Give CowSwap a try and enjoy perks like no gas fees paid for failed transactions, optimized transaction management for multi-sig and DAOs, as well as some other fun entertainment surprises. Head over to cowswap.exchange and start swapping today. Dan, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Yeah, uh, thanks so much for having me. I've been a fan of Epicenter for so long. Uh, I'm just delighted to be here. <laughs> Dan, so we go way back to uh, to your, you know, to my consensus days. So t tell us about yourself and how you got into the blockchain universe. Ah, well, I, I guess I, I'll try to keep it brief, but with a little taste of why it caught my eye. You know, like, sure, I got paid for, in Bitcoin for a, an odd job uh, one time, and that was cool, but I lost it in Mt. Gox. And it didn't really catch my attention. I mean, I saw the Slashdot article when it first came out, and I thought it'd be cool. I did not learn how it worked. I, I went to the faucet. I have no idea how much that would have been worth. I definitely don't have that anymore. Um, and then uh, when I was working uh, at Apple with my friend uh, Kumavis, um, uh, he went to a meetup and, and started talking to, uh, a, well, a friend of his, uh, of ours, uh, Dominic Tarr, who is the creator of Scuttlebutt. Um, we'd met him through the Node, uh, the Node JS community, and he was really into decentralization. You know, he made Scuttlebutt. I remember attending a workshop he made on making peer-to-peer -peer chat rooms, and uh, he he pointed out Ethereum to Kumavis, and then Kumavis went to a meetup with Vitalik, and then he came to me, and it uh, it sparked my imagination. You know, it was like he it was all he wanted to talk about at lunch, and I was there for it, and so we we were just like riffing on it. There were a few applications I'd tried to make in the past that this seems suited to. So things like a debate system where you could uh, figure out how trustworthy a claim was or a voting system where you could allocate funds or microtransactions. And like, these were all things where it was like, oh, finally money in the internet. This is great. We started trying to make a thing. Of course, there was no account manager yet. So we made MetaMask and, you know, it, it built in all of our prior assumptions. And, and I think that a lot of the blockchain space today is kind of built out of everybody's initial impression of what this new alien technology is made out of. And um, and we we made our best shot at it. It was good enough to make a lot of stuff. And that's kind of where we are now. We've been iterating and fine tuning and improving and uh, for a few years now. Um, I think we validated it enough that, you know, obviously now there's a lot of big players entering the space and, you know, like well-funded thing. It, what, yesterday, Robinhood announced they're going to have a Web3 something uh, You know, all, all that's very interesting. Um, it's it's very funny for me where I feel like we've done so much wrong and we have so much to fix for to have people copying the current state of things. I feel like I, all I see is is ways to improve. And, and I feel like everybody's kind of still just doing impressions of, 
Web 2. You know, it's like we want to have kind of an account model, right? Or like and money or, or something. And I think I think there's a lot of kind of um, a lot of uncertainty about what it's supposed to look like eventually to interact with dApps. Um, and I think that we've kind of finally figured out patterns that really work and we just haven't shipped them all yet. And we're like in that process. So I, I think we've like, you know, just earned in this wonderful wealth of experience and we've built up a really amazing team. Recently, we brought the My Crypto team uh, in and, you know, they're another one of the wallet teams that just has consistently seemed to just have their their finger on the pulse of like user actual needs, you know, understanding like the gravity of the situation and how, how kind of carefully we need to move with uh, changes and things. Um, so the, yeah, sorry, there, there it is in a nutshell. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that, that's pretty much how I got into it and how I got to where I am now. Yeah. Awesome. That sounds cool. I, I guess we can go a little bit into that, right? As, as you just mentioned, you said you basically weren't hired directly to build a wallet, but you kind of figured it out with within consensus and now maybe you can tell us a little bit about how how that journey was uh, from building metamask into what it is today um and and how maybe a bit about the team how it grew yeah uh yeah kumavis had started metamask even outside of consensus and uh so when when he got hired at consensus suddenly he had the capacity to offer jobs to people and so i was like you know i i was kind of uh, early in my tech career so i was i was a uh, uh, let's say not as eager to jump out and start making my first startup as he was, uh, but I joined him as soon as Consensus was funding the project, and I was really excited to. And um, and yeah, the, the Consensus was this wonderful, just kind of chaotic uh, incubator at the early stage. There's like I don't know, it must have been hundreds of different experiments getting uh, validated and tried out there, and there was a really exciting energy, you know. Um, surely there were a lot of projects getting built um, before the kind of platform was ready to really support it. I think, I think back then it was very normal to just kind of build your application as if the blockchain was going to scale or did scale already. So you'd just treat the Solidity contract like it was a Rails backend and keep everything on the chain. And I think I think that over time, people have had the scalability issue hammered into their heads and have a lot of different ideas about how it needs to get addressed. And um and yeah, that's just one of the one of the ways that we're continuing to kind of grow and evolve. I was thinking back earlier on how I first used MetaMask when it came out, um, and kind of we've we've all gotten so used to living with browser extension wallets, right? Um, so, but zooming out, um, I kind of I remember um, how dodgy it felt <laughs> back, back then to, to kind of interact with a browser extension for something that. Um, that is so obviously um, a value transaction. So how did you and Kumavis make that decision to kind of build this as a browser extension rather than um, a standalone application? Yeah, so when we first started building, there were, the Mist wallet browser was already kind of occupying the, the standalone installer space. And so... They were they were also doing a full node thing, so you'd install this uh, this in executable, you'd get a browser, and it would sync the blockchain, and your computer would heat up, and you'd you know wait. I think it only took like you know fifteen to thirty minutes to sync back then, but you know still it was a kind of weird experience every time you open your laptop, kind of heat it up or whatever. And uh, one of the kind of founding principles for MetaMask was we want to make it easy to get in, right? So we're trying to like what how do we smooth the adoption path? Uh, what are the assumptions that we can kind of weaken and and that are like maybe okay to compromise on for first time users? Uh, the first of which was uh, using Infura, having a, a hosted kind of trusted connection for the blockchain to start. That was a very controversial uh, take at the time, and you know there are still some people that feel very intently that that's like you know fundamentally wrong and broken. And you know I would love to see long term more. Uh, blockchains that are lightweight enough to run on consumer hardware, but um, that's not ETH1. Uh, ETH1 is just kind of impractical to ask users, like, especially when they're first getting started, right? When your first interaction with the new dApp is somebody saying, hey, here's a way to sell an NFT or something, right? If the barrier is first install this, you know, 20 gigabyte thing on your hard drive, and then you can look at a picture, that's that's a very hard sell. And so Kumavis and I were both were both web developers. We both had a real love for the kind of 
permissionlessness of the web. The fact that you can drop a, a link into any text chat that you have with someone completely between any channels. It could be, you know, an SMS, it could be an email, it doesn't matter where you take this magic little link and now suddenly you're in somebody else's world. Like that was for us one of our design goals. We're like, you should be able to click a link to one and go to it. And um and yeah, so so that that was kind of a guiding principle to start. And uh, Kumava spent, um, a, you know, a, a first initial pass, a, a good portion of a first year, trying to make the whole wallet kind of light browser work entirely without an extension, like working within an iframe within the browser, basically building a browser in the browser, which is, uh, you know, an impressive uh, thing to try. And then at a certain point, it was either me or Nick Dodson was just like, hey, wouldn't it save a little time if we just ma tried making a web extension? And, and he was like, yeah. And, and it like he took what he'd done and, you know, in like uh, three days or something, he'd put it into a web extension. And then I was like, all right, let's get this ready for a hackathon because um, there's South by Southwest was coming up. And um, so we just got it good enough to hack on uh, just to play with. And there's this music hackathon, had a whole bunch of music creators and ha hackers who'd never heard of blockchain before. It was just a music hackathon, not a blockchain hackathon. And we started telling them, you know, hey, what do you think you could do if you had money in your music ecosystem you know i was we were touring with ujo at the time and um you know just you know a lot of ideas were things like oh the microtransactions of what if you make a beat and then you get paid when people mix it into beats and you know things like that and you know artists know artists know what it's like to not get your work valued adequately and and yet they also know the value of their audience and more and more with the internet with kickstarter and you know a, a patreon and things like that people know having access to your audience is powerful and so I think it was it was a great event and um, and yeah it kind of from there it, it was high friction a lot of people were skeptical a lot of people you know other hackathon uh, hosts there were like uh, uh, you know I'm gonna still recommend they maybe build a wallet into their application you know because it was just too weird at that time but you know that's we've seen culture shift a few times during our time here at MetaMask and um, yeah why an extension wouldn't it be more stable as a as a desktop executable. Um, I mean, I, I totally believe that long term, more of this stuff should be lower and lower level. You know, you want the maximum security, you want open hardware, you want hardware wallets, you want the, the maximum guarantees you can get. The browser really was a decision because it's it's an on-ramp. It's a first experience. It's, it's about being able to give somebody just that link that drops them in as quickly as possible. And and really, I, I think that we can do we can do much better even than our current thing, the, the current norm of making somebody get a wallet and then log in and select an account and get some ETH all before they can like like a post or something. I think I think that that's a bad design pattern and I think that we can do better as a community for that. But um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, yeah, kind of getting ahead of myself. Yeah, we definitely want to like hear more about where you think that should be going. I guess, right, as you said, you uh, kind of were part of the, making these design patterns that are now there, like sign in with your wallet, things like that, right? In in this hackathon, it seems that wasn't even a thing yet and people didn't really know how, how that interaction would work. I guess it's also segue to like MetaMask is not just a browser extension, right? There's also MetaMask Mobile, which which I guess is has been a big trend to get like more people on board, right? People are used to use their phone for their banking apps or wallets or in general to use their phone. Um, and then Obviously, you made the choice to also build MetaMask Mobile. Uh, can you talk a little bit about where that is at, how this decision was made, kind of how people use it today? Yeah, I think mobile is one of the easiest decisions in the world because uh, you know you just look at the the, the numbers. Uh, most everybody just about has a phone, and not everybody has a computer. And you're like, okay, well there you go. Mobile's therefore has to be the future. Um, now, I think there's some real advantages for the desktop, which is that in particular, uh, everything's getting programmed on a desktop. So, so if you're the developer tool, then you're going to, you're going to make the developer is going to make sure that you're compatible with them. So, so the extension has this kind of developer experience advantage. And I think that there's, there's kind of an uphill battle to make sure that, uh, that web three sites kind of work as well on mobile. And, you know, we've got a ways to go on that developer tooling, but the goal was always to basically say, you know, same promise as the web, you know, you make a website and it works on desktop or mobile, that shouldn't matter. Um, you know, we're trying to build an internet of value. You should be able to take value wherever you go. You know, it's not just confined to when you're sitting at your computer. 
it's, you know, it's a dynamic thing. You should be able to make any agreement anywhere you want, um, you know, within your own terms. You know, maybe you, you don't carry around the, <laughs> you don't carry around your uh, grandmother's pearls on the, when you're going out, but, you know, you, you bring some spending cash, you know, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Can you give us um, some idea um, how many people use MetaMask? How, what kind of values are stored in MetaMask? What kind of use cases it's actually used for by people? Um, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm, I don't usually say this. I'm pretty sure like 98% of people who listen to this podcast have firsthand experience with MetaMask, but I think kind of hearing the stats is still um, warranted. <laughs> Yeah, so the latest number I heard is that we finally got to around 35 million uh, monthly active users. That's somebody who in the month has uh, interacted with an app. So either they connected or they approved a transaction or a signature or something. Um, and the use cases are actually quite varied. Um, you know, depending on your corner of the crypto sphere, you might be in a bubble and you might think that there's only one major use case. Um, you know, I, I know that the NFT community sees itself often as like the kind of one thing that's going on. The DeFi community definitely had a period of seeing itself as the possible main use case. Um, gaming is also for many people, the only use that they have for MetaMask or Web3. Um, and, and then there's, meanwhile, there's the whole DAO ecosystem, people, you know, figuring out how to issue grants and fundraise collectively. Um, I, I think these are all really cool in different ways. I think they all have some common themes of kind of giving people ownership of digital rights. Um, and I, I do kind of think of a wallet as one of these computer-like things that has to be dynamic. It has to fit your needs. It can't be, well, I mean, don't get me wrong. It can be custom tailored to a use case. So um, some some wallets, you know, maybe ones that you might have mentioned in the intro might be giving a very uh, good experience around something like staking, for example. And for somebody who wants to get yield on staking, that's great. And, you know, uh, having lots of staking options really quickly is a really reasonable niche for a wallet to occupy. And there are other wallets that are specialized at gaming and there's other wallets that are specialized at NFTs. Um, I think partly just for historical reasons, because MetaMask kind of was the first thing that just made like anything possible. We're kind of in this position where we we still kind of serve everybody. And so we, we kind of are in a position where by necessity, partly, and then also because it's an interesting position, continue to pursue being a general purpose wallet. Um, and, and you know, frankly, I, I wouldn't have it any other way. I think it's a really, really interesting problem. Um, I've come to know the, the, the challenges and solutions that are available to this uh, kind of niche. I think they're kind of essential to safe computing in general. I think the problems that we're taking on as a wallet are actually pretty much the same problems that you have keeping your computer safe. The reason people uh, get fished and hacked on the web is not because there's cryptocurrency, it's because there's cryptocurrency and people don't know how to keep computers safe. Like there's kind of two problems here. And if cryptocurrency had evolved in an environment where people knew how to keep computers safe, I don't think we would have this problem. But I don't think that history ever pushed people to secure their computers this hard before. And I think that we're kind of seeing, oh, okay, we've had personal computers for, you know, 30 some odd years, but the truth is they're kind of badly secured, kind of just good enough. We have to invalidate our passwords every two days just to kind of have a chance at not getting identity thieved. And I think it's, for, for me, it's, it's forced me to step back and say, hey, wait a minute, like, computers themselves are kind of like alien technology. We're kind of just car a cargo cult around uh, computers saying like, what are these good for? Can we build society on them? You know, but I don't think we've answered fundamental questions about computers yet. I don't think people, but, but I think that the patterns are emerging. So things like permission systems, things like having good sandboxing, I think those are like the beginnings of like, oh, oh, keeping untrusted things at arm's length. And I think that those patterns that you see, you know, Android's got a pretty good sandbox and permissions model. I think that's very similar to what we end up being in the internet of value. And so we're kind of we're rediscovering kind of the same principles. We're saying, what does it mean to have some digital rights or responsibilities and then selectively uh, kind of wire them together, not just with your printer and your disk drive, but now with like the rest of the world's computing. And uh, doing that in a coherent and safe way is like, it's like the whole, it's, it's a very big, fun, interesting problem for, for computing in general. Wow, yeah, that's, that goes super deep. And I know you are also 
kind of part of this Agoric community a little bit where this is this kind of related, right? The object based capabilities and and kind of trying to keep things secure like that on the smart contract level. I guess uh, I'm, I'm also wondering where is the wallet part in that? Is there are there certain areas where the wallet plays a role or is it really just on the contract level that you you kind of shrink the security, the surface or are there like specific things on, on the wallet side that can be improved in your opinion? Yeah, yeah. I the, the general ideas that I'm describing about making computer systems where you can reason about how to keep them secure, those are very those are problems that I learned the Agoric folk had been thinking about for a long time. And I think some of the richest literature on that topic is coming out of them and their community and kind of adjacent groups to them. And and I, I've really adored my time like getting to know them and and getting to collaborate with them on some some projects. We we've been uh, funding them on a grant, uh, we're due to renew them, um, but uh, for their uh, secure JavaScript or hardened JS project, which we're using to secure our supply chain and for building uh, a portion of our uh, our extensibility system, Snaps. And so, um, sorry, coming back to, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. So, so you were saying, is that related to Agoric? Yes, absolutely. Agoric, I think, has a lot of experience building uh, d distributed systems. They kind of tend to draw people into their community who hit similar problems, saying like, oh, I tried to build an open multiplayer world, and I realized it's hard to make that safe. And then they end up coming to a kind of similar consistent conclusions. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that there's some good, uh, good <laughs> uh, camaraderie there. Um, I kind of was avoiding the the jargon. I, I I'm practicing avoiding jargon as much as I can. If I say object capabilities, you might say, "Okay, what? The, I don't care," <laughs> or, or something, you know. And so, but but you know, if I say, uh, you know, make make it understandable when you're taking risks, you know, that's basically the exact same uh, thing. Um, the, the idea of the object is that an object is this abstract thing. You own it. You know, it's like a token or an NFT is an object. And how do you basically maximally allow a user to interact with that and do things with it? Um, you know, the norm on blockchains today is one person has something. If you want to do something, if you want to stake it, you know, you put it in that contract. You know, there are allowances. Allowances start to resemble sharing capabilities. Capabilities are kind of like extension cords where you're like, you plug a port from one thing into another. Um, today, the norm for smart contracts, everything has its own ports. You know, uh, ERC-20 has one allowance standard. Uh, ERC-721 has another allowance standard. ERC-1155, the, the multi-token standard that Bored Apes uses, it has another allowance standard. And this one is not granular at all. When you give someone permission to, you, to withdraw one board ape, you allow them to take all of your board apes. And this is the crux of a whole phishing scam. Um, this morning, uh, Seth Green, uh, you know, I know this will air like a week from now, Seth Green came out and uh, he apparently was fished through an allowance scam just like this. You know, they were able to ask him to approve one. Uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of problems that kind of combine to that. There's, there's a problem of sourcing the metadata to represent this is one of your things you care about. This isn't just a random smart contract. And then there's a problem of the granularity of the permission. Like you shouldn't, you know, issue to all of them. It should maybe just be to one. So yeah, yeah. Uh, the the basic theory is how do you how do you give people good authority over the things they have and have access to, and yet give them the ability to compose them, right? So safety and composability. We we don't want to tie people's hands and say you're safe. You know, <laughs> we we want to say. You know, okay, you can do whatever you want, but like, here's 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 how to stay safe. Here's here's the lines around the the dangerous bits, and you know, do what you're willing. You know, do what you want. You've touched on um, a multitude um, of different topics, and there's a lot to unpack. Um, maybe let's start at the very beginning of setting up a wallet. So basically, you set up a wallet, um, and then there's the seed phrase, <laughs> the twelve uh -huh. words, or sixteen words, or whatever. So. Um, I mean, we've kind of, we, we've gotten used to that, right? So basically, um, we, we know it's coming, but zooming out again, this seems like a terrible user experience, right? And mm -hmm. um, so maybe let's, let's talk about um, where you see um, the future of seed phrases. Do you see a future of seed phrases? Uh, I guess for legacy purposes, uh, <laughs> you know, like you, 
you want, you might want to be able to back up some old things that are not transferable. Although, you know, if I have my way, the uh, Ethereum blockchain will adopt some EIPs that allow you to uh, transfer account holdership to other accounts. And so you should be able to migrate them then too. But uh, yeah, so maybe, but but I, I think we should be able to move off them as much as possible. Um, I think it's, it's nice that people have the option to be in total custodial control of their wallets. It's even critical that people have the option of keeping things totally cold. Being able to uh, send assets to something that is unhackable entirely is like, it's great. It's, it's a proof that this is a decentralized system, that nobody can take your asset from you, that you can be as safe as you can keep anything. Um, and that's, that's all great. Uh, the problem is, is that today, okay, you get this one secret and it has all your stuff, you know? And okay, so if you're very advanced and secure, you might keep some on a hardware wallet. But then hardware wallets, they innovate even slower than the software wallets. So the things that you can do, the transactions you can review, they're fewer and fewer. And so you're trading off the usability of the system for security. And so that kind of comes back to, okay, tying your hands and saying that you're safer. Um, I, I think that we can do better than that. Ideally, you know, you'd go to a site, you could use it a bit, <laughs> do some things. And then if there was at some point something you cared about there, you could have the option to back it up in any number of ways that are, you know, kind of risk tolerant to you. You could say, you know, uh, do you, have, you know, if you've got a hard drive, that's good, fine. If you trust your disk, good. It, you know, if you want to use a hardware wallet, great. You know, if, if you're cool with uh, putting it on your mobile phone, using your mobile phone as a signer, um, that's more solid for most people. If you've got an old phone that you don't use, that's a, a, an upgrade also, and it's viable. Uh, and if you want to wire together a multi-sig, you know, for some higher stakes things, that can make sense. And then I think that kind of the most critically missing piece that I think nobody's looking at right now, just to drop a little bit of uh, alpha or whatever, is is the allowing your different devices to be delegated just the permission that they need to operate. There's been a little bit of this from contract accounts like Argent who have self-assigned daily spending limits, but those self-assigned limits are still from an account that holds everything. And so if it gets compromised, you still lose everything. Uh, I want to see a, a world where you could have a cold wallet whose assets you delegate to a hardware wallet in some limited capacity, whose assets you could then delegate to your hot wallet in some limited capacity, you know, and so you could have, you could have any number of accounts on any number of assets and you don't really think about them as accounts and assets. You think of them as accounts or, or sorry, as assets and each asset may actually have a secret key behind it, but you shouldn't have to reason about that. You should just know I've got a bunch of stuff on this cold wallet or on this hardware wallet and I'm setting up a new device. So what do I want that device to have? You know, do I want it to be able to uh, give away my board ape? No, then don't give it permission to. Simple as that. You know, that's the that's the like kind of object capability thing. It's just like consent, <laughs> like no permission without consent, right? So you should be able to have cold stuff, but then you should be able to delegate limited permissions. You say, this is going to be my. I'm going to be voting on the ENS DAO from this. I don't want to sell the tokens from this. I want to vote. So you should be able to provision just the permissions you want. So you should be able to say, I want voting rights on my hot machine. I don't, and, and now your hot machine would be literally unhackable for anything other than that purpose. And if it was ever hacked, the worst thing that could happen is some bad votes get cast in your name, and then you could revoke them from the uh, initial granting authority device. But that sounds like, um, I mean, that sounds like more private keys, not fewer, right? So basically by having more granular permission settings, um, you would actually um, ha have to, uh, you know, hold and control way more private keys than you currently. I mean, so basically there are some people with stupid amounts of money on MetaMasks, right? So basically you see them at conferences and they show you something and you go like, okay, seriously, you, 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 this, this, this is... Uh, yeah, don't yeah. tell me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I know that ages ago at Consensus, there was this project that kind of looked at like this in-game 
um, location thing as as a seed phrase? Or do you, do you think seed phrases will ever um, become more human memorable than they currently are? Or do you think we will just have to rely um, uh, on backup mechanisms and guardians and social recovery mechanisms? Where do you think it's going? Well, I mean, kind of like I, I said at one point, I think people will be able to choose the ways that are uh, preferable to them. So if you want to do a brain wallet, you should be able to delegate, you know, you like you could memorize the right to withdraw all of your funds. Right. And and then if you can memorize the key that controls that, then you can back up the message that imbues that key uh, on a public website. So everyone could see, oh, there's a key out there that could, you know, withdraw all of your funds and send them to the Bahamas or whatever. Um, and, uh, and so, so I, I don't see any problem with people having the option of having a, a memorized key and, okay, so do we get away from seed phrases? Well, if somebody wants a seed phrase, if somebody wants to be, have 12 words that they back up, maybe because they have, you know, there's so many crypto steals sitting around or something. Um, I, I think it's fine for that to be an option, but I think a safer norm is that usually devices generate keys in a secure enclave and those keys never leave that device. And so usually when you're deploying to a new device, you're deploying to keys that cannot be extracted. And so the only way to extract value from those is through signatures and operations with those keys, which while it should be rendering in a human readable way. And so, you know, if, if all is done correctly, it's harder to fish from uh, wallets that are doing that because there's not just one secret that's maybe harder to reason about the, to steal. Instead, you have to get a user to hopefully perform an act of consent that they've they've been habituated to recognize um, before you can uh, take from them. So yeah, I guess I guess in short, I think I think devices should have their own keys as much as possible. You should still be able to to, to delegate capabilities to other keys. At the end of the day, this is all built on cryptography, right? You're not going to get away from there being private keys somewhere. Um, I think that we can make them less portable. Um, uh, I think some people will still probably choose to back up to seed phrases, but those will probably be pro users who, you know, just know what they're doing very well. The average user is probably going to prefer to have something maybe like social recovery or maybe maybe a custodial backup with just a you know limited allowance and fraud protection, just like banks do today, except open ended, Turing complete, and able to connect to smart contracts. It's funny. So basically, had we recorded this episode two years ago, um, I think everyone would assume you're making the case for smart contract wallets here, right? Um, so tell us about, can you talk about how the how the um, thinking has shifted from smart contract wallets to EOAs with enhanced capabilities? Oh, um, I think the line is a little blurry. Um, so, so I'm talking about just the general principle that things should be delegatable. And actually, so, so I'll share, I've, uh, I've been working on a little solidity library to kind of demonstrate what I've been, what I'm talking about. Um, it's a mix in that any solidity library can inherit from called delegatable. And when a, when a contract has that, it gets a generic delegation interface. And so now they can delegate any permission on with any restrictions to any other key. And so you can write these delegations to other keys. Um, I think that composes well with smart contract wallets. A smart contract wallet is good if you want to get a group of signers to agree on something. Um, but then a delegation is good for if you want a one agent, which could be a group of signers, to then kind of permission another agent, which could be either a key or another group of signers with some limited authority. So you could have a DAO that says, okay, well, we need you to go shopping. So here's a here's an allowance, right? We don't need to approve the budget request. You know, can you imagine going to the grocery store and then scanning the checkout line and then waiting for your, you know, <laughs> your token holders to vote? Like, no, no, of course not. You need permission to do things to interact in a dynamic world. And so I, I think that I think that DAOs, multi-sigs, um, all of these higher security constructs are going to, I, I think by necessity, if they want to be dynamic and composable. They're going to need to embrace systems where sometimes they broaden uh, the reach of their, you know, the, the broaden the the inclusion of control over their digital assets. Um, I think this is just normal, essential composability, and uh, so I think it works well together. I think that more things should use 
uh, yes, yeah, smart contract logic to assign authority. And ideally, every EOA would have access to this stuff. And actually, one of the reasons I'm a proponent for EIP 3074 is it would allow every EOA to assign a smart contract to be able to act on its account. And so if you, you had 3074, every account could assign um, off-chain delegation methods for anything it could do. And so you could you almost you wouldn't need allowance methods on contracts anymore. And this is basically what the delegatable uh, mixin does. Uh, you don't have to write allowance methods anymore because it provides um, a method for anyone to sign these off-chain messages that can imbue uh, its recipient with any uh, arbitrary power. They it, it uses a smart contract as its enforcer. So yeah, to me, it's it's just another tool in the kind of I guess it's a tool for composability. I see the smart contract wallets as largely a tool for adding restrictions on controlling assets. And I think this is kind of a counterbalance where we're saying, okay, we've learned how to keep things tighter and tighter. Now you need a multi-sig, now you need a token vote. Um, but how do you how do you now how do you relax a little bit? Once you've built up trust in your community, how do you um yeah, uh, authorize or empower more people to to act on your behalf? Yeah, I think that that's super interesting. I guess maybe to tie it back a bit to that board ape story where you get permission for like transferring out all the board apes. In this scenario that you're describing, if I delegate this to another address, like do I have to kind of specify which contracts exactly uh, can it interact with? Like how how does that look in practice? Is there some standard needed that it says like you know only these contracts? Like how? How will that actually look? Or do you always have to give like complete control? I guess that's that's kind of where we're heading. Like, how do you, yeah, make that possible so there are more um, fences basically to to choose from where where you want to put them? Yeah. So the the delegatable system by default, a delegation method can imbue some, the recipient with all of your authority on that contract, but it has this caveat system where you can add as many caveats as you want to a delegation. And those caveats can restrict it in any way you can imagine. So um, I, I was making a proof of concept uh, for detecting fissures and reporting fissures. I want to make a web of trust. I want to permission as many people to detect fissures and report them as possible, right? Uh, it's obviously a high, it's a high value target for something like this. And um, so, so uh, what I realized is, uh, okay, the phishing registry is ownable, but I want to share the ability to report fissures, not the ability to transfer the entire registry. And so I wrote a caveat, you know, it's like three lines of solidity that says, uh, not the ownable methods, no transferring ownership, you know, none of that, just reporting fissures. And now I can sign delegation methods where people holding these methods, no, no on-chain transaction needed, no gas, I can send them this permission. And now with no gas, they can sign a report. And it's a meta transaction friendly thing. Someone else can support it, submit it for them. Or the, the even crazier thing is uh, no one can submit it. If it's something like a phishing report, you can just kind of counterfactually gossip this message and anyone can look at it and they can say, oh yeah, anyone can submit this. The same way a minor ex extractable value person can do. They look at the message and say, oh, I, I could call that transaction. I would see this as a fisher. And now we can build this off-chain registry where it's all rooted in on-chain permissions. The contracts enforce it, but um, by looking at the contracts and building up these messages that could be submitted to the chain, we can build up these kind of blockchain parallel databases that you know can be any size at all. The only thing that has to go on chain is when you're revoking your permission to someone. You say, oh, actually, their, their messages aren't good anymore. That has to go to the chain because you're trying to make sure nobody trusts their message anymore. That's where the censorship resistance of the blockchain kind of plays in. How far do you think this is in the future? Oh, well, I mean, I, had, uh, I have a proof of concept of that that works now. Um, but it doesn't scale really great. Um, the, part of the problem is because the individual clients um, usually don't have a full blockchain node. Um, but, but you know, if, if I make a node that lets you hold those messages, now you have to be able to validate them again to validate them against the, the node that becomes very expensive. So we either need to have like CDNs caching it, or we need a good client side lightweight caching layer like Laconic. Um, a friend, uh, Rick Dudley, is working on this kind of caching system, it builds on another client. And now your wallet would be able to cache just the information from the contracts that you kind of are interested in. And it only updates those when those contracts update. You get the block header and now you have a proof that your stuff hasn't changed. It's gonna be so good for things like uh, keeping your token balances up to date. Cause you know, 
Today, on every block update, every single wallet is checking your balance on every token, on every network of every type, and then plus the ones that they want to auto detect. So it's this super network intensive thing. Um, but but meanwhile, we, we literally, the blockchain is designed for you to prove that things haven't changed. So it's this kind of embarrassing uh, caching opportunity that that hopefully Rick is going to solve really soon. I really need it, Rick, because because the whole scalability of this scheme that I'm describing hinges on the people's ability to compare off-chain messages to the the current state of the chain. Well, it's it's funny how how it kind of crosses uh, this gossiping uh, net network with uh, you know the on-chain state. It's uh, super interesting. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, there's obviously so many really amazing ways of scaling right now. And I I was thrilled when I realized that this construction that I was kind of building for the sake of user consent, when I started realizing, oh, it also has scalability properties. I was just, oh, I was so happy. <laughs> I was like, and but it's funny because it maybe shouldn't have been a coincidence because um, granting new permissions is historically not a thing that requires a blockchain, right? You can right click a JPEG, you have permission to view the image, right? The blockchain has always been about losing control. It's the double spend problem. It's that when you give someone money, you have to lose access to it. So for any situation where you're growing trust, I think we can keep things off chain more. And so I, I think that we can build wallet patterns and, and DAP interaction patterns that are actually more off chain friendly. And I think this can mean that when users use a DAP for the first time, they can actually postpone needing a wallet a lot more. And actually, my my uh, phishing uh, DAP proof of concept, I, I'm calling it Moby Mask. You can go to it at mobymask.com, um, like Moby Dick, because uh, because we're whales trying to take out fishers. Um, it's invite only because like the whole thing is you have to have a delegation signature, right? But um, but when I was making it, I was realizing, oh, you can redeem, you can get invited, and you can report people without a wallet. So I started realizing I, I had to move the wallet connection further, further down. I had forked a project that had the wallet connection, you know, that big wall at the beginning of the DAP. It says like, pick a wallet, get a wallet, look at all the wallets in the world, scroll by them, find yours, you know, that horrible experience. What I realized is, oh, we kind of recaptured that spirit of the hyperlink. Like you, you got a link, I give you an invite link, you get there and you're going. And there's literally like, do you need a backup? Well, the backup is actually the invite link that's in your text message. So you almost don't need a backup. So when using this system, you the only time that you need a seed phrase is if you, well, if you want to delegate to it, so you want to back it up like cold or something, you know, like obviously there's higher, higher stakes use cases where you would want that. But for lightweight things, you know, you can start to really ask which things do you actually need a backup for? Like, I bet you there's a lot of things that don't need a backup. There's a lot of things we're just like spreading permission saying like, hey, vote on our proposal, you know? Okay. You know, that should be, it should be like that we should not need a wallet, like most of the time. And, and then the wallet is like for the meta transaction relayer, it's for the pro user, the, the admin, the person who's like, you know, revoking access the person who's like adjudicating disputes and stuff. Those are the people who need to submit to the blockchain. And maybe that actually ends up being a pro user thing. And then mo most users never even look at gas. That's, that's a hope I have. And, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be playing with that more. I hope people try out that delegatable ETH uh, thing, which I'll be like publishing right around the time this is coming up. I really want to look into this now. Uh, the one thing that kind of immediately comes, comes to mind is, does this somehow make you um, vulnerable to spammers? Because basically there's no longer costs associated, right, with kind of sending messages. Yeah, so the the nodes that could be vulnerable to scammers or spammers in this situation would be like the caching nodes. So if anyone can sign a message, then you could gossip around kind of fake messages. These messages are validated as chains of signatures, though. So in order to spam them, you would have to have a chain of valid signatures that the node hadn't seen before. So it has kind of similar spam properties to a normal uh, blockchain node. Like it's validating a signature is the first thing. Signature validation is free. You know, like if you, I don't know if that's a secret, but like you could kind of spam any blockchain node with a bunch of signatures that are fake and they're going to, they're going to check if the signature is real, you know? Um, so, you know, you can always layer some extra uh, anti-spam stuff on top of that, just rate limiting, um, banning people who spam, you know, once, some, once one IP has submitted one bad signature, you know, then rate limit them and increase it. You could probably borrow like 
tit for tat with forgiveness out of BitTorrent or something like that. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't think it's more prone to problems like that than other uh, blockchain type nodes. All right, I guess maybe tying it back to MetaMask a bit from from this, right? I guess how how actually does this interact with MetaMask? I guess you're saying we're moving this a little bit and then the wallet comes later. Is there some scenario where then finally you get the sign in and you use MetaMask or is this like a completely separate layer almost? Yeah. No, I think that they interact. They they have a relationship and and I I think it's nice if it's like You can think of it as you can have assets on a site, and if you're not moving them out of that site or going anywhere else, then you're probably fine without a wallet. In in many ways, I think the wallet is kind of this place where you take the, your capabilities and you bring them to other contexts. So the thing that's always been cool and exciting about Ethereum it's the composability. Like anyone can, you know, host a server with a token, but the thing that's really crazy is like, oh, every single token is a public API, and anyone can build a DAO that uses it as its voting rights or an exchange that lets you swap them like any like everything's open everything's permissionless so it's that context switching that's like the real power of web3 the like everything is permissionlessly open um and so uh, in this pattern what what my initial impression of it is is that you could have a, a lot of websites that and dapps that are not needing a wallet connection until some certain actions it could be relaying transactions to the blockchain It could be loading those assets into your wallet so they're portable. Um, it could be, oh, loading them into the wallet can also let you do other cool things. So I, I told you that the delegation for, for delegate.eth, um, it supports arbitrary caveats. So when you delegate to someone, you can have whatever terms you want on it. Now, I made the Moby Mask site. Every, del every invite link just has the same terms. It's just like it's revocable. You know, you can report fissures, but I can take it back. Um, But if you if you made this a standard and added it to a wallet, then then in your wallet you could go down your assets, you could click any asset, and you could say, okay, send them uh, that allowance. But and then you could like have a list of of terms. You could say just you know just this many tokens, just for this much time, only for these uses, you know, only on approved you know SEC approved investments or whatever you know. And you can have whatever terms you want. You can just stack them up and. Um, I think that the wallet is a nice place to kind of uh, aggregate these many things into a coherent set of possessions, a digital possession, so that now you can go to other places and you can log in now. And and now when you're logging into sites, you've got all these like standard, nice ways of defining your own terms. You know, normal terms on Web2, they say, we need these permissions. It's a rigid thing. You get no say. You hope they have a logout timer. You hope they have 2FA. In this scenario, When they, they ask for what they need, maybe they just need some tokens so you can do a swap. And now you can add whatever extra terms that you want. Um, so you, you actually have a, a part, you're, you're participating in the negotiation of terms when connecting to websites in this in this paradigm. Um, and so being able to load these kinds of uh, assets or these messages into your wallet um, is a thing I'm excited to do. Now, I just made a proof of concept, uh, you know, solidity contract. Who am I to like tell the Ethereum community that's the new standard? But that's not how I that's not how I run things. Uh, you know, this is part of why I'm building a SNAP system. The SNAP system for MetaMask is an extensibility system so that new standards like this can be validated in the wallet. So I, I actually don't need permission from the rest of my team to try this out and to add it into the wallet. And other people could take what I did and they could say, oh, you messed up in these ways. And they could make their own standard and they could add it into the wallet, too. And so um really kind of coming back to the the notion that MetaMask's role in the ecosystem is to enable permissionless uh, innovation, right? That's what Ethereum is good at. Um, that's what computers are good at. <laughs> that's what the web browser is good at. Um, we're just trying to kind of get out of people's way. And, you know, so I have my theories about what I think a, a secure, safe, consensual digital interaction looks like. But uh, rather than just impose them, like, you know, I could say, oh, we, integration's coming every few weeks. Or I could say, you know, some exchanges, they have listing fees. They, you know, say, oh yeah, your standard gets in for the right price. No, we're, we're taking an approach of the wallet allows anything in. We're trying to build a tool that lets people just be creative and, and lets people move around with the digital assets they have and hopefully reduce the risk and let them kind of uh, cooperate in new creative ways. 
I still want to talk about the snaps in a little bit, but before that, let me kind of tie in with what you said. So basically, if you f if you fra reframe this a bit, um, it would actually give you um, a sort of fragmented identity system for yourself, right? So basically, you can you kind of decide what to share with 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 which um, services and smart contracts you interact with. Um, so how how um, how do you see the connection between MetaMask and um, a self-sovereign identity system? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I see it as a form of self-sovereign identity, I guess. Um, I, I have some qualms with the, uh, the identity framing of the issue. Um, I think oftentimes identity is usually related to somebody making a claim about you. Like, like, oh, you're a citizen or, or you're not. And um, and claims are, are nice and interesting uh, for some uses, you know, and like I'm saying, I, I want to be able to report fishers. I think, you know, claims are great. Um, what I think is really critically different about uh, what I'm describing is that I'm not just talking about the wallet holding a bunch of claims about yourself. I'm talking about the wallet holding the things that you can do and allowing you to extend those permissions to other things. So these aren't just claims that you would trust somebody to do something hypothetically. These are literal cryptographic messages that imbue the recipient with that ability. And so I think it's got a much higher leverage uh, implication once you connect. So, you know, if you connect to a site and they want a token allowance, that's because they want to interact with your tokens right now. And that's what makes it powerful. We should allow composability like that for anything, but with user sovereign uh you know, attenuation. The user should be able to say, ah, but on my terms, right? And so I think it's very, very related. I think that the the only difference, the only difference that I really see between like a verifiable credential system and an OCAP uh, object capability type system is whether the claim is rooted in a ability to do something. It's, does this, does this signature mean you can now just call a function and make something happen? Is there a robot that will literally redeem this signature for something? Or is it just kind of like, a claim, you know, like a claim. Okay, we can have an internet of claims, but like, okay, so people are gossiping. I guess that's nice, but I guess what I'm really in this for is I'm trying to build scalable social systems, and that means oftentimes spreading access to resources. Right? We're really talking about how do we how do we combine our resources in a more efficient way? How do we fund the best thought out projects? How do we like kind of pathfind to those things? And and so for me, creating actual access to resources is just a more interesting problem. Maybe going into a little bit like from the user side, now you're saying the user has like a say, is that really like on the level or is it what you're imagining on the level of me being a Web2 user, like like just normal person going on his computer and somehow specifying these limits? Like how, how do I get the idea? What should I be limiting? Um, it's just like... Can this just be done by like some developers? Is this would there be some interface for you to understand this? I, I sure don't want it to be just developers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, the whole point of this stuff, right, is that normal people should be able to use it. And you know, of course, it makes sense that developers can do it first because we're building these systems on computers. So if you speak the a language that computers understand, you're at an advantage. Um, and I would just encourage any listener if you think that's hard. Just take a stab at it. There's a lot of a lot of online courses make it a lot easier than you ever thought. You know, I learned on some of those online. I learned on Scratch first. It's, a, it's made for kids to learn to program. I, I learned on uh, you know Udacity and Coursera. You know, these these websites are excellent at teaching you these things. So I don't actually think that programming is that hard. But even that said, I think that you know rather than saying I think it should be made so easy that people who don't program should be able to do it, I I might say. I think that programming should be made so easy that anyone can do it or something in between. There's like that, that line should be blurred. We're talking about computer enforced agreements and we want people to be able to interact with those agreements. So the design space is wide open. There's a huge opportunity to, to enable people to participate in digital agreements better. It's a huge space. And, you know, I, I think the way the wallets work today and MetaMask included It's, we're hard coding the types of agreements that we can represent to a user. And that's an embarrassing state of affairs. You know, that's why things like, I mean, I, I really, I really feel terrible about like the, the Seth Green situation because like, you know, 
it, yeah, it said said approval for all on his confirmation, but I don't think it said like the Bored Ape Yacht Club. Like, I don't think we'd loaded their metadata in, you know, and today that metadata curation is a manual task. It's like a GitHub repository. But obviously what we should be doing is, you know, broadening the reach of aggregating all that kind of information. And, you know, again, it kind of comes down to that delegation thing. How do we spread the right to populate our metadata registry more broadly, right? Because we need to be able to protect people in so many use cases, you know, um, and we need people to be able to inform each other. We don't want them to have to trust us. We want them to be able to like declare what they trust and then get as informed as possible through those sources. No, no, I think this makes total sense. I think there's, we're so early, right? So basically, if you look at um, the governance and security space, so basically, if you don't want to, um, trust one single person, then basically, how do you how do you trust um, a group to make the right de decisions? How do you? I mean, I yeah, I think this is uh, yeah, it's just the the kind of problem set we're currently um, facing. You you um, you talked about snaps earlier, um, and I would like to cover that. Um, can you give us an intro on snaps? Yeah, snaps is an extensibility system for the MetaMask wallet. Um, there are a lot of dimensions to the wallet where we found ourselves being gatekeepers inadvertently. We didn't try to be gatekeepers. We just realized that everybody wants to add their network. Everyone wants to add their token. Everyone wants to add their, you know, fraudulent transaction detection system. Everybody wants to add their new blockchain, you know, their new EIP method for better DAP logins. You know, there are all these dimensions where we were just finding ourselves... You know, uh, us against, you know, it, a, 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 a large group of very passionate and intelligent people. And we don't want to, you know, we don't want to be arguing against a large group of intelligent, passionate people. That's the worst. We want to get the hell out of their way. We want to let them just like ideal. you know, it's like, I think people get held up on the open source component a little bit. People are like, oh yeah, you know, if you were just open source, somebody would fork it, they'd make a better wallet. Well, the truth is you fork it, you're going to add the one feature you have in mind. You're not going to add all the features that every user wants. And so I think that the heart of like actual like community driven creativity is more about composability. It's all about the same way Ethereum is all about the contracts being able to interact with each other. Uh, I think that, you know, the wallet is kind of your personal smart contract space where you declare what you care about. These are your these are your assets. These are the things you're willing to connect to and trust. And um, so Snaps was an answer to how do we bring in all this innovation? How do we get out of the way and let people contribute to wallet evolution at the speed of their creativity, not at the speed of our review process? And uh, so, yeah, we, we did a lot of research on kind of secure code confinement, and there's obviously a lot of interesting things on that. Uh, it led us in particular um, to, to meet the Agoric folks who were working on uh, JavaScript confinement. And so they actually have, a, it's basically a JavaScript function that allows you to evaluate code in a confined context. So, you know, if you're, a, if you know JavaScript, you know, the word eval is like evil uh, because you call it and then the, the string that you pass to it can do anything. And that's terrible. And so you should never call eval. But the Agoric folks made this thing called a compartment where you can now call eval but it only has access to the things you give it. And so it's this kind of local code version of kind of what I'm talking about when I talk about connecting to dApps. You, you can now run some local JavaScript and give it just the permissions that you want. And so very much like the way you connect to a, a dApp and you give it some you know, blockchain-based permissions, now we can run some local uh, wallet extensions and give them some local wallet permissions, like the permission to add a new uh, token type to your, to your wallet or a new account type. And so we've got uh, prototype snaps for adding a variety of blockchains to MetaMask, uh, for adding contract accounts to MetaMask, um, for adding new phishing detection. Um, as there's a password manager one. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I was starting to prototype a new signature standard. Um, you know, there's EIP 712, but there's a fifth rev revision. And rather than pull requested to MetaMask, I just prototyped it in a snap. You know, it, it kind of opens up the space of uh, wallet innovation outside of a standards process. I, I think standards processes are not permissionless innovation. Um, you know, right now there's a little bit of a movement to like, hey, all the wallets should make standards together. And don't get me wrong, there are some things where we should just do it consistently so that we can interface and interoperate better. 
But you know what's better to me than standards is spaces where people don't need permission. Um, you know, maybe this is just me because like I'd wanted to get into entertainment for a while, you know, and like <laughs> if you ever tried to get into entertainment, well, at least, you know, when I was doing it, it was like, oh, the Hollywood, you know, like establishment or whatever. Um, obviously, it's different now with podcasting and YouTube and things. But, um, you know, whenever there's a situation where you have to ask permission or you have to get other you have to convince other people just to do it, it just feels like the wrong way to me. Like, I, I really care about building tools where people can just have ideas and run with them. And, um, you know, and computers are great for that computers. But as long as you build those computer systems in a way that are friendly to in integration, and that's kind of what extensibility is. And so uh, I think Snaps is incredible for MetaMask, but I actually think long term, every application will be extensible and it won't be like you're an extension on one other thing. It'll be like these things work together. Uh, it'll be more just collaborative um, the way that contracts are on Ethereum. Yeah, I, I do think it's like a nice extension of that Ethereum idea of like, you know, permissionless innovation and just taking it on this wallet level. And I also liked where you said, okay, general purpose wallet, other wallets are kind of building things specific for the use case. I think that's a frustration for a lot of people that it's like, oh, when does MetaMask ask like this new network that, and why is it so hard to switch the network? I guess Snaps would, as I understand, try to address that, but on the level that, yeah, I know everyone can add that. But now I guess my question would be, okay, we have all these people that can extend it in a way for a user. How does it actually look? Do I have to like choose which extension I want to support uh, from these snaps or is like there's some automated way or, or how does that actually from the user side work? There's a particular pattern that I think is going to be more and more important. Um, and it's like the process of adding something to your wallet. Um, Today, there's kind of a norm of auto-detecting tokens. You know, um, I recently heard a wallet advertisement that said it detects all of your NFTs, for example. Um, detecting all of your NFTs, to me, scares the crap out of me, um, partly because uh, we know that fishers will do airdrop attacks. And so they'll airdrop you something that looks valuable. But when you try to send it, it'll give you an error message that's crafted to direct you to a phishing page things like that. Um, not to mention there's forms of abuse, like airdropping people, uh, lewd photos, you know. Um, and and so, so I actually think that, you know, it's a lot like an email address where you don't actually want it to be public for anyone to just add anything to your wallet. So I think that we have to uh, eventually adopt norms where people are consensually adding assets to their wallet. And I think that that addition can come from anywhere. Um, so for example, today MetaMask has Uh, EIP 747, and it, it's called the watch asset. So a, a website can say, hey, care about my token, you know? So I, I have a personal token called uh, Dank, Dank coin. Uh, you know, nobody has, uh, I've given it out to like 20 people. You know, it's, it's a joke coin. But, you know, uh, I'm not going to add it to some central registry where all MetaMask users have to see it. That's That would be ridiculous and a waste of network bandwidth. But what we do have, we have an API method where If somebody goes to my website, they can press the add to my wallet button and then a little pop up appears. And if and it says, do you want to add that to your wallet? And if the user agrees, now their wallet will load. It has my my face as the icon, you know, and, and they can use it. Um, snaps work very similarly to that. When you're on a website that wants to interact with, let's say, another blockchain or another token standard that your wallet doesn't know about, they'll just say, hey, uh, To, inter to interact with this, we recommend you have this governance module in your wallet. And you say, oh, okay. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to have a, uh, a couple tiers of security, obviously. We're going to have, like, indications of who's certified it. We're going to have a very responsive kind of revocation and, you know, Fisher flagging system. And then the user is going to have the list of permissions it needs. You know, this snap may need network. It may need a private key of its own. You know, some snaps may even need a private key that's dedicated to a given protocol. Like if you're making another Ethereum signer snap, it might need your Ethereum keys. And so we're going to add, we have friction on that to like make sure people are extra sure. But ultimately, yeah, there's a, there's a part of an interacting with a new entity that wants to rely on some new kind of asset where they're going to say, hey, uh, you need this to work with us. Once you have it, though, you don't think about it anymore. So it's a little bit like micro wallet onboardings. Um, you know, you can postpone them as late as you want, um, but as you use Web3 more and more, your wallet will come to represent kind of 
the places you go and the ledgers that you care about and the assets that you track and it'll just kind of let you use those and so it'll be a lightweight wallet by default but it'll be a dynamic wallet that can become what you need it to be oh i'm sure we'll see a lot of innovation on that one so basically in terms of visibility and uh, even reputation systems right so basically yeah um i want to cover one last topic when token when dao dan <laughs> okay um yeah, so we've been exploring uh, making a grants DAO. Um, you know, we we want to. There's a lot of things that we'd love to fund, and you know, we we've got a revenue model that's turning. So we we want to give some back to the community. So we we are exploring how we might run something like that. Um, if we do it, I, I I would I would stress uh, we're not exploring distribution mechanics that could be gamed. We would start with small groups of trusted people. And we would probably take an iterative approach similar to what Optimism's done, where you know distribution can be continuous. And I think that uh, more communities should embrace continuous, uh, you know, continuous recognition of community engagement. And I don't think things like that need to be a one-time event. Um, but uh, but you know we're we're exploring that. And you know grants is one application. Obviously, we we have lots of ideas of what tokens can be used for. And the truth is, they can be used for a million different things. And I also think people should kind of get off the idea that tokens need to be a singular great thing, right? Just because somebody makes a grant style doesn't mean they never have another thing they want to make. Um, I saw a whole uh, wiki portal that did a review of MetaMask and they were criticizing an idea I had once about do it, tokenizing uh, our prioritization backlog. I just wanted to let our team kind of help weigh on our backlog. You know, we got a big backlog. But they're like, they're like, oh, this is not a, is this the most valuable thing they could do? It's like, get off it. We can have tokens about as many things as we want and it's all good. Um, you know, but, but, you know, I think the key thing is we're, we're never going to like watch out for the, the scam bots the, I I'm so apprehensive about when people start speculating that we have a, a token coming because, uh, you know, they're like, oh, well now they're suddenly looking out for some bot saying, Hey, there's a, here, redeem your airdrop now. I promise you, if you ever have access to MetaMask tokens, it will not be because some bot replied to you on Twitter telling you to follow a link. Don't follow links. I mean, for crying out loud, if you're a MetaMask user, you might think that we'd have like a way of getting in touch with you, right? So how about just like go to the wallet as your source of information about MetaMask? And that goes for support as well as any any other things like that. So if you if you ever need support with any product, really. Start in that product's interface. Don't go search in Twitter. Don't go searching Telegram, who does no moderation. Uh, search in the product. Start with your root of trust. What's the thing you trust most on that thing? It's probably the product maker themselves. Go from there. So stay safe out there. Uh, we'll we'll play around with tokens because we we want to play around with the whole ecosystem more. Um, but you know, please don't uh, don't hinge your hopes and futures on on the you know prospects of flipping it or something. Yeah, I think that's. That's a great way to wrap it up with the token. Dan, thank you so much for coming on. It was like super informative. It took like a way different turn than I personally expected it. I I learned a lot and I hope our listeners do. And we're we're looking forward to um, seeing all these new new things coming from, from MetaMask and um, what people will build with it. Dan, where can people come and learn about MetaMask? Well, we, we have a Discord channel run by Consensus, and we have a, a community forum, which is, uh, you know, you can vote on features there. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter. Uh, we've got, you know, a fairly active Twitter thing. You can you can at us, but be aware that there will be some scam reply bots. We are working on it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, if anybody claims to be giving support publicly, don't listen to them. Um, yeah, uh, so you can ping us on, on any of those. It would be fine. The community.metamask.io is our forum. Perfect. Thank you, Dan. It was a pleasure. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Cool. Thanks so much for having me.